Awesome. This event is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube for future reference. I am Sharon Bassey from the Office of Sustainability, and we've brought together a wonderful panel to talk about our um, overarching topic of wellness and self-care for the month of February, and that can like branch off in many ways, but today we're specifically talking about equity and waste and how um, reproductive health and menstrual care ties in with sustainability. I'll quickly give the floor to our panelists to um, introduce themselves, wave. Tell us where you're from. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Did you want to go in order? I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Order. Th that's good. OK. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Juliana Goodlaw Morris, and I'm the sustainability manager actually down at Cal State San Marcos, one of the sister campuses. And um, Sharon and the group brought myself and another colleague um, from Northridge to here because we've been working on this um, initiative on our campuses for the last couple of years now. And so welcome, thank you for having us today and super excited. Hi everybody, my name is Sarah Johnson. I'm the sustainability program analyst in the Institute for Sustainability at Cal State Northridge, so which is in, in the LA area. Um, and like Juliana had mentioned, working on similar initiatives on our campus. And um, we really want this to just be an open conversation and to kind of hopefully start the conversation about um, reusable menstrual products and serve as resources for you um, going forward. So very happy to be here, thank you. Christine, if you want to unmute yourself and quickly say hi and your department and where you're from on campus. I don't know if she can hear us right now, but um, I'll quickly give you an note. She is the nur a nursing supervisor here on campus and um, she's Christine Hurt and she's going to be talking about um, sexual health resources on campus. And then we also have Sandra, if you could quickly introduce Hello. yourself. Hi, my name is Sandra Torres. I am from the Zero Waste team in the Office of Sustainability and we usually do student campaigns. So I'll be talking about impact and alternatives that students can do. Awesome, so I will kick it off. Before we get started, I want to give a little bit of a background on how health and wellness tie in with sustainability. Um, sustainability isn't always just about the health of our planet, but also the health of the people who live on it. We're linked to our environment, environment and our environment is linked to us. Wellness includes the, includes the aspect of respecting other people's identity. We encourage you to use your pronouns in your Zoom names, your email signatures, and your MyCSUEB profiles. Um, I also want to talk about inclusivity. I'm no expert and we're not going in depth um, with this um, in the presentation, but it is important to understand that not people who identify as female menstruate and not all those who menstruate identify as female. Um, understanding people's gender identity, sexual orientation and background is important. Um, for a better understanding, feel free to reach out to resources at DISC or contract the Help Center. In the past, we know that the Hope Pantry has also had like um, menstrual, pro menstrual products if you need access and you're living on campus. Um, I'm not sure about their availability at the moment, but they'll also be a good resource. Um, if you're new to the idea of sexual and gender identity, you might want to do this activity that I'm linking in the chat. Um, this was shared to us by Claire Valardama Wallace, who's in the nursing program. And it has a bunch of definitions on there and um, kind of like a quick like a game if you wanted to play. Um, I'm also including this link to a website that has resources that educate people on puberty, repro reproduction, relationships, sex, and sexuality. Um, thanks again for joining us. We're going to be hearing from sustainability officers Juliana Goodlaw Morris from CSU San Marcos and Sarah Johnson from CSU Northridge, who've implemented award winning programs related to sustainable menstrual products on their campuses. And then we'll be hearing from Christine Hurt from the CSUEB Health Center about campus resources. And then um, Sandra Torres has prepared a quick presentation. Um, for us on alternative menstrual products. So Juliana, I'm passing over the mic. And I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, and 
Um, can you all see that? Oops, actually, I wanted to share. Let me stop for a second. I'm sorry. I wanted to make sure I share the sound as well. Yeah. Um, here we go. Can you all see that? Great. Yes. Right. So um, I just wanted to start quickly with kind of the background on what our goals were within CSUSM and Northridge, just so you're all on the same page. But basically, we wanted to connect sustainability with access and affordability to menstrual care products, reduce the stigma around menstruation, increase visibility of the waste and health um, related issues associated with single use menstrual care products, increase the concept of gender inclusivity, which you just spoke about, Sharon, and um, support the basic needs and student success initiatives on campus. So that was the framework in which we were um, going about this work. However, for my campus, I will say that it actually started with this person. Um, Marina Flores was the instigator of this on our campus. And I wanna share this quick video um, and hopefully the sound will be up and everything will be good um, because she's the one that actually got this going on campus. So, can you hear that? Flowers. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Great. And my sustainable menstruation product project was super important for me to bring to my campus to be able to talk about the stigma surrounding sustainable menstruation and just menstru menstruation in general. It's really cool to see after handing out 60 plus products that only 10% were not feeling the product that they received. It's really cool to be able to have an open discussion with them to provide them with more details on which project product would be best for them. It was also really important for me to make sure that these open and inclusive discussions were as inclusive as possible. Not all people who are women menstruate, there are non-binary, trans, and gender non-conforming people among our community, especially on campus, who feel often excluded from these conversations. So being able to make sure that they're included and we're having these safe discussions with other people was really important for me to do. About 6% of the people that received products were actually among trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming. So it was really cool to see as well. It was awesome for all the feedback. It was a great three-part event. And I'm just so thankful for everyone that helped around with it. ASI, the Sustainability uh, Department on campus and the Gender Equity Center. And yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry. My name is Marina Flack. All right, so uh, Marina started this whole program and she uh, she was actually really successful um, initiating it and then received a grant from, uh, we have a sustainability projects fund available through ASI. And so she received $2,500 to distribute menstrual care products to students. And I will say that it wasn't all just um, menstrual cups. We also did um, pads as well, reusable um, pads. And so um, we started this back in fall of 20, spring of 2019, fall of 2019. <laughs> And then um, this past summer, we partnered with Organic Cup, who did an organic uh, campus cup program where they were able to give us over 300 cups to distribute across campus. And so we distributed some in fall of 2020, and now we have more to distribute um, this spring and probably fall again, just the same amount. We, you know, students aren't close by right now, a lot of them. So I mailed a number of them, but I didn't mail all of them. Um, and so I still have a few more that I'm going to be using either with housing or our pantry, et cetera. Um, just a couple points on who kind of was involved, obviously Marina, ASI, the Stanley Program, Gender Equity Center. We also had environmental studies um, faculty that were engaged and student health and counseling services as well. Right now, because of COVID and where we've transitioned, um, I'm partnering with outdoor recreation, housing, Cougar Pantry, which is our you know on-campus pantry, and then the Cougar Care Network, which reaches out to students that are most in need of services right now, whether that be um, on the brink of homelessness or having just struggling mental health, et cetera. And so um, they just received a whole bunch that I sent them um, in which they can distribute as they see fit as well. Um, this was just a photo and one of the events I think this was the first one, the breaking down the menstrual stigma event that we had. So similar to this conversation, um, and you can see there are a couple other um, events that happened um, back in fall of 2019, 2020 um, academic year. So some of the lessons learned that um, that we've I've found is that really the partnership. So it's great to see um, everyone who's on this 
uh, webinar or Zoom call. Um, coordinating with housing, student health, like I've mentioned, um, the pantry, et cetera, has been really, really beneficial to get the word out to students, right? Again, not all students are nearby right now, so we wanna make sure we're trying to reach them as much as we can. Um, and then from a personal standpoint, so just um, back in, I have been thinking about menstrual cups for a long time and, you know, being in this field and I finally, like, it literally took me six months to, to like jump the, <laughs> jump onto the bandwagon, I should say. And so um, one thing that Sarah and I talk about is there is um, a quiz on our website and we can put it in the chat, but put a cup in it.com. Um, and they, you can take a quiz um, and it'll shoot out a variety of, of cups for you. And so I had done that quiz like a million times over trying to figure out like, which one should I buy? And knowing that they're pricey, right? Like I didn't want to drop $30 on something that wasn't going to work for me. And so I um, took a long time, but then when Marina came to me and said she wanted to do this project, I was like, well, gosh, I better be the expert or semi-expert and have been using it for a while. So I finally did it and I can't believe that I waited so long. So um, I would say, you know, do your research, but maybe not wait six months. <laughs> um, take that quiz we were talking about uh, and don't give up if, um, if it's the first one that you try and it doesn't work out because sometimes they just don't. Um, you can actually sell your cups online if you want. Um, there's swaps. Um, and I would, the last thing I would say is follow some Facebook and Instagram um, posts. There's put a cup in it has a number of different groups on Facebook and Instagram, as well as just YouTube videos. And um, one of the things that Sarah and I have put together is kind of a, um, a document I'll share as she's speaking um, around kind of resources and um, questions. We've given a similar presentation to other, um, to other folks and we put, a whole, there's a whole bunch of questions in it that people asked. And so you can go back and review that as well um, if you're interested. And, um, but it's been a really successful program and I hope that, I mean, this is great East Bay that you're, you're jumping on the bandwagon and hopefully um, more schools will. So thanks for having me and I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah, there's my email if you ever have any questions um, and you want to reach out. I'm going to stop share here. Okay. Sorry, thank you. I was trying to get my window up and unmute at the same time. So I'm Sarah Johnson from CSU Northridge and let me do this full screen. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Good, yeah. okay. So um, a lot of what Julie and I did, we worked together. You'll, you can probably tell that we worked together very closely um, on these initiatives that we did on our campus. So a lot of it is similar, but um, we have some unique things that we did as well. So I'm gonna talk through some of these things. Um, so very quickly, it's already been touched on, but really the um, framework or foundation for why we did this is, you know, working in sustainability, there are many economic, social, environmental impacts um, related to um, menstrual products. And so, you know, you can see that the cost, especially for students, can be very expensive. You know, if you're spending, um, you know, hundreds of dollars per year, think of what that is in your lifetime. And, um, you know, we all know that this is a, a basic need and really should be a basic right. You know, there people shouldn't have to, um, you know, be breaking the bank every month to pay for a menstrual care product. So that's why that was something that was really important to us from an economic and basic needs standpoint. Um, single use menstrual products also have a lot of chemicals in them. And that's something you know, that we're putting into our bodies. It's harmful for us, it's harmful for the planet. So that's very important to us as well. Um, and then, yeah, the waste issue, you know, there's a lot of waste that comes from single use products, you know, you use them for a few hours and then they go to a landfill really forever. Um, and there's tons of plastic in them. So there's just, you know, it ties in with sustainability very greatly and it's like it's a public health issue. Um, so those are some of the reasons why it was important to us. As Julie mentioned, this, I don't, I definitely don't want to take the credit for this because this also came to me from a, um, very active and passionate student on campus who she was at a conference actually, I think, was that another CSU? I, I can't recall which one, but she went into the restrooms and they had um, free menstrual care products. They were, you know, single use, but they were free. And she was like, wow, why don't we have this at CSUN? Why do I have to put a quarter in? Or why do I have to go, you know, to the convenience store and buy them? And so she actually then, the pr project evolved because she initially requested funding to have just free menstrual care products on campus. And then she connected with me and our Women's Research and Resource Center. 
Um, and then we started talking about reusable products. I'm like, well, that's actually really more cost effective because it's kind of a misconception that they're expensive because yeah, it's you know, $30, $40 for a cup, but a cup can last eight to 10 years with proper care if you wash it and store it correctly. So the cost like overall is actually much, much less expensive than single use products. So that's another thing that we wanted to um, make folks aware of. And so she actually applied for funding from our associated students um, and we got $13,000 to buy these cups, but we worked with our student union. Um, I'm from the Institute for Sustainability. Our associated students also helped us with the marketing that I'm going to show you. Um, we worked with an art class and we're currently working with our food pantry as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we received $13,000. We used most of that money to purchase um, reusable cups. And then we also put on a large event. Um, we did a lot of social media campaigns. So this was our flyer. And I include this in here because this really goes back to breaking down that stigma, right? And dispelling those myths where you wanna be able to have an open stigma-free conversation. And so we wanted something that was kind of edgy. Um, you know, We didn't wanna play it safe and just be like, oh, you know, Aunt Flo or your period, or um, we wanted something that really tries to, you know, spark some interest and some some conversation, which this really did. People are like, wow, that's, um, that's interesting. We actually made stickers and we see a lot of folks on campus with the sticker of this um, juicy papaya on their water bottle. So that's kind of cool. So this, I mentioned, we have worked with an art class. So if you're an art student, or maybe if you know um, folks in the art department, this was a really cool campaign where it's a social impact design course. And so it was a capstone course. It was a group of students. They went around campus and took photos um, with menstrual cups, with um, employees, with students, um, you know, in like popular places on campus, again, to just normalize this, right? You know, everybody that menstruates wears, you know, bleeds every month. And so um, you know, this is what's inside their bodies when they do. Like it doesn't, it's nothing that to be ashamed of. It's normal, um, you know, it's, and it's beautiful too. You can see like they made the cups look into like works of art. And so we wanted to show um, that, that it's beautiful to menstruate really. Um, and so we held this event and I wanna mention this because there's a lot of ways you can reach students. And so if you are a student on campus that does programming or if you work with any of the departments that Julie and I mentioned, um, this is how you can make it fun and exciting. And so if you see in this top left, we had a student actually um, who's not even an art student, but she's very you know creative and artistic. And so she created this backdrop. And so it was really fun for students to take pictures with it. Um, we had we hosted a panel. We showed a documentary. Period. End of sentence. It actually won an Academy Award um, for best short documentary, I believe. Um, so we showed that, and then we did a panel discussion after. Um, again, to break down the stigma, have this open, honest conversation, and that was really successful. We had um, a few hundred attendees for the event. Um, we also had like a photo booth, art exhibit, um, and then we gave away cups at the end as well. So a lot of different ways that we can engage people. And I'm happy to chat more about you know, the details behind putting on any of these events if anyone is interested to. Um, so as I mentioned, we did distribute some cups um, with, at our food pantry. So right now we have, um, you know, anyone, it's, our food pantry is also open to employees. And so anybody can go there. We have that put a cup in it quiz that if you take the quiz um, and give, you, give us your email address, you can get a free menstrual cup. Um, and then when we are back on campus, you know, obviously because of COVID, everybody's remote, but we do plan to host another in-person event in the fall or when it's safe to do so. Um, and then we're currently looking for funding to um, keep this program going. We don't want this to just be like a one-time initiative. We do really feel that it ties in with basic needs and student success. And this needs to be something that's accessible for students every single year, not just a one-time event. So that's something that's really important. We're trying to make this a con continued program. Um, and then just on a personal note, like Julie had mentioned too, I've been a cup wearer on and off for, for about six years. I, well, I used to wear a cup, a menstrual cup, and then I had a baby. And so that didn't work for me anymore. And so I kind of took some time off. Um, and then I took this quiz kind of like Julie, where I was like, oh, you know, a few different, it gives you like four different potential cups. And so I was like trying to do too much research to decide instead of just picking one and figuring and seeing how it worked. Um, and so then I got one, it didn't work, took some time off again. Um, but I finally found one that works for me. So I will definitely say do your homework and the resources. There's tons of information out there. They're really popular now um, and becoming much more common. And so like YouTube has videos on how to insert them, like has even reviews on all the different types. So if you do your quiz, you can even go on YouTube and type in salt or diva, whatever. And you can like watch tons of people's reviews of using those cups. So that will help too. Um, and then there's a lot of resources, like Julie mentioned, that we can link to of resources that we created um, and then workshops that you can find online. So um, I, will, I will definitely say give it a try. Um, it's not necessarily if it feels like it's scary, it's if there, it's once you get used to it. Um, I actually prefer it much more than disposable products. Like Julie said, I wish I um, would have discovered them 20 years ago because it saves so much money. It's better for the planet, better for your body. 
So yeah, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions and share um, more information about any of the things I talked about. There's my um, email address. And then this is that link too that we'll put in the chat to the Google Doc. Let's see, I can stop sharing. There we go. Christine, are you on? Do you want to unmute yourself? Sorry. Sorry I didn't get on earlier. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, again, I'm Christine Hurt. I'm the nursing supervisor at Cal State East Bay. And I, what I wanted to do was present what we have at Cal State East Bay so our students can become more aware of what we have available to them. So we're just going to give an overview. If Sean, can you put up our my slides? Do you want me to put up the family packed one or the contraception one? Contraception one, thank you. I'm not as a talented as everybody else. So I asked for assistance in this area. So I wanna give an interview uh, overview. Oh, that's the family pack one. <laughs> there we are. So I wanted to do it contraceptive methods available at the student health and counseling services. And next would be the overview. So I'll do some contraception options, contraception effectiveness, emergency contraception, and family pack. That was the second one. You can go ahead and move forward. Next one. So what is birth control and, or and contraception? All of you are probably a little bit aware of all this, but maybe just a review. So the birth control or contraception is any method or device used to prevent pregnancy. And um, women can choose from, from many different options of birth control. And in choosing a method of contraception, dual protection from the simultaneous risk for HIV and the other STDs also can need to be considered. Although hormone, hormonal contraceptives and IUDs are highly effective, at preventing pregnancy, they do not protect against STDs, including HIV. Consistent and correct use of the male latex condom reduces the risk of HIV infection and other STDs, including chlamydia infection, gonorrhea, cocal infection, and trichomonas. <clears throat> Next. So what are the different types of birth control? So the reversible method of birth control is also known as the long-acting reversible contraceptives or the LARC methods, which are the intrauterine device, the Mirena, and the implant, Nexplanon. The doctors do many of these insertions, as you, as you probably know at your facilities also. So what are the different types of birth control? Short-acting hormonal methods would be like oral contraception, the patch, the shot, and the ring. Um, so what's important to realize is a pill is taken at the same time each day, um, a patch which you would put on once a week in the lower abdomen and the buttocks and upper area, but not on the breast. That's something that um, when we have students come in, we really need to educate them on this because sometimes we find that to be an issue. Um, in relationship to these, it releases hormones such as the progesterone and estrogen into the bloodstream. And you, you, of course, you have to put a new patch on every week. Um, when you put in the um, ring, you have to put, you leave it in for three weeks and then um, remove it for one week. Um, when you use the depo, use a depo injection. And many times you hear the word depo, that's what shortened version. Um, they, it's given to the women in, um, in their buttocks. Many times they like it in the arm though. Um, we find that, that they do like that. And they do, they usually get that every three months. Um, and the hormonal vaginal contraceptive ring, the ring releases the hormones that's the progesterone estrogen. And you place the ring, ring inside your vagina and you wear the ring for three weeks and you will take that out for one week so that you're able to have a period. I've actually never heard of the previous presentation. 
So I think that would be something very interesting to bring forward to our facility also. So I will be contacting you. So what are the different types of, uh, continuing on the different types of birth control or the diaphragm and also the use of the male condom? Um, birth control, you know, is used in different ways and the diaphragms is placed inside the vagina to cover the cervix to block the sperm entering in. And the male condom is, which is well obvious as well, worn by the male. The male condom keeps the sperm from getting to the woman's body. And latex condoms are the most common type. They help prevent pregnancy and HIV and other STDs. So looking at this, this is a comparing the different types of contraceptive methods. And what's really important is to realize that what is more effective and what works for you. So um, the internal or the next one on use of uh, contraceptives are like, you usually only have one pregnancy per 100 women um, in a year. And those would seem to be the most effective, but maybe not work for every person. Um, and then you have, of course, the... Um, the depo, the pill, and the patch, and the ring, which is you have usually four to seven pregnancies for 100 new women in a year. So um, that's something else. Is it's what works best for the woman, and then the least effective, but yet it's better to have something than nothing at all. Um, is the male condom, the sponges, um, the female condoms um, are also used here. So something that we talk about which is emergency contraception, which is the next slide. Um, it's a method uh, of birth control that can you, you can use if you've had unprotected sex. And um, it's important to realize that you have, there's a, not what I call a grace period, but there's like a five day period in which you need to make sure you get um, protection uh, or what they call plan B, some people call plan B or the morning after pill. And you wanna make sure that you obtain that before you go past that time because the increase, potential of increasing for pregnancy is that within that time frame. The longer you wait, the more problematic it is. So what this all comes down to, which is really important is really encouraging the students to, um, you can go to the next slide, um, to, make appointments at the student health and and to do that it's you can either call via the main line or um, you can uh, go online and make an appointment to see um, to make an appointment with a provider and I really encourage you to do that so that you have the protection that they you need for for yourself and there are so many different options to choose from um, so Family planning and access, and I real briefly give family pack. I have another little bit of a presentation on family pack. It's really important, but I just want to get, catch it up on family pack is a program that um, provides family planning and related services, and there it's delegated to people who can qualify. If you're eligible for family pack, you can receive family planning services for free, and this is something that is so important for students because they don't have a lot of income. And so it's important to be able to, if they are able to qualify for this, that they get it. And the various birth control methods, um, including the long, long acting reversible contraception, emergency contraception and sterilization are all covered under this planning. Um, so family planning and counseling and education is covered and sexually transmitted diseases such as STD testing and treatment are also available under this plan and are covered. So HI and also HIV testing. Um, that's it for this, this part of the presentation. I was gonna give a little bit more and I can um, on family pack. So I don't know if everybody has family pack at their facilities. But I just wanted to give a quick overview of Family Pack eligibility and what are covered and how to apply, at least for Cal State East Bay. Um, so, what is Family Pack? I kind of mentioned this already. It's family planning, um, access, and treatment. 
and it's providing comprehensive family planning services to eligible California residents. And I think this is the one thing that um, we have to stress because sometimes people are not California residents and uh, students and they don't register as a California resident, so they may not qualify. But the three things are that you're a California resident, low income, and medical need for family planning. Um, so what's covered, this is what so helps students so much is any type, any form of birth control, which are birth control pills, long acting form of contraceptives such as Marina, next one, Kylene, you hear all the commercials too about the dancing and so forth that goes on, on this uh, commercial. Um, so they are stressing it, I'm very thankful for that. And then they have the coverage of the depo, Provera injection, the patch in the ring. They do cover plan B, STD testing and treatment, vaginal infections, urinary tract infections, and condoms um, for male and females. So they can get the resources, they can get this is by um, calling uh, our health center and they can get you an appointment. You can go online, of course, to look up for family pack and you can fill out the form and um, making an appointment though is so important for many of our students to get that first step. And it's, um, it's really enjoyable to see the students realize that things are out there for them and coverage um, for them at any point in their student career. So that's it for me. I hopefully give you a little bit more information on what we have at our facility. Okay, so I will go next and move my screen. I, we can't hear you. You might have to yell a little. Got it. No problem. All right. Is this okay? Or is it a bit soft? Say something. I didn't hear. Um, do I hear you fine now? Okay, yeah. Yes, I can hear okay. you. Okay, cool. Oh, I get it. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, can everyone see my screen, right? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. All righty then. Hello, everyone. My name is Sandra Torres. I'm from the Sustaining Spirit Club, and I will be going over the impact of master products. So here we go. So the materials that we'll cover today are materials of disposable mental products, waste impact, social equity, economic equity, and solutions and alternatives. So disposable master products. All the ingredients here are will be sensitive to users. Um, we have synthetic fiber and cotton. I'll be also listing why these are in here in the first place. We provide soft steel, foam and infacel that absorbs up to 10 times its original weight. Chlorine, which provides a wider appearance for muscle pads and phthalates. Phthalates are uh, softens and restricts airflow, so it traps your, your flow, and, but it leads to dampness and heat. And because of that, it leads to bacterial growth for some users. Tampons have similar ingredients to pads, except they have more plasterizing chemicals that provide a smooth finish. So the waste impact. So these plastic packages of menstrual products increased over time. Tampon used to be just carbon and cotton, but now we have plastic applicators. So when these are disposed, the plastic applicators are not accepted to recycling facilities due to sanitary reasons. And bathrooms, they don't, they specifically stated not to flush them, but when they do are flushed and the sewer systems fail, they end up in the ocean. So imagine all these products from one individual, which is approximately 11,000 disposable pads and or tampons in a lifetime. So you can imagine that being flushed into bathrooms too. Social equity. As mentioned before from Twitter Marina from Juliana's presentation, pronouns be exclusive over gender identities and expressions. So we have this saying here, not all who identify as female menstruate and not all who menstruate identify as female. So this would help exercise thinking to help you respect people's gender identities and expressions. Pink tax, economic equity. So what is pink tax? It's when female marketed products are charged slightly higher than products marketed to a male audience. And most of these products are usually wrapped in pink colored packages, hence why pink tax. And a most powerful thing is that these are charged on necessities, things that people need in their daily lives. 
and also menstrual products too, which not everyone who menstruates can avoid. They need to purchase these. So that's the economic equity. So what can we do? Respect gender identity, uh, switch to alternative menstrual products to your best convenience because we understand that the pink tax and the high budget. Well, with your dollar, if you could support with your dollar, check which products profits to charities and social justice movements and have a conversation. Uh, talk to your friends about which products works best for you, what works best for them, and what brands to dress. There's also research. For people who are sensitive to disposal of menstrual products, um, avoid fragrance and avoid pesticides. And there are also charities and nonprofits that help with period poverty. In the following, we have four organizations, period, freedom for girls, dignity period, and these for girls. They all work on distributing period menstrual products, providing job opportunities, and also a menstrual education to people. And we have the last five safer sustainable alternatives, and these are just general. So we have silicone menstrual cups, organic cotton menstrual pads and tampons, reusable washable pads, and also similar period underwear and reusable tampon applicators for the organic cotton tampons. Just as for the sake of time, this, gen this presentation goes to be very general. And again, have a conversation with your friends about which brands you can trust and also take the, um, the cup quiz. And that is all for my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen. All Goodbye. right, now we can open up the panel to questions. If you have any, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them or send them in the chat or send them to Nikita if you'd like to um, her to ask someone on your behalf. Okay, so I do have a couple of questions that came on the chat. So one of the questions was for uh, Juliana and Sarah. Sarah um, so without funding, would you have been able to do your program? And if so, how would you have approached it? So as you can see, Sarah got a lot more, or her program also got a lot more um, money than, than ours did initially. Um, I don't know if Organic Cup is going to continue with their Campus Cup program. I imagine maybe in the future, um, it, because I mean, getting free cups is amazing. One of the things that um, I think it's mentioned, I, I don't know if you offer it, but I know Sarah, we have we have free menstrual care products in our Gender Equity Center, Student Health and Counseling Services, um, a couple different places on campus, people could go get tampons or pads. And so prior to this event, we had actually started talking about potentially offering reusable care products. And so I know COVID has kind of thrown a wrench into all of this, but the hope is that when we come back that the budgets that were being used to purchase these single use um, tampons and pads that a portion of that could be used for reusable um, menstrual care products. And so in the absence of funding, and we never know where funding is going to come from in the future, that is something that hopefully when we get back, we can continue the conversation. The actual programming can happen without any funding, right? I mean, we can do programming for pretty cheap on the fly. I think um, it's the actual offering of free care products that are important. Um, and so, I think cobbling together funds from all different sources is your best bet, like reaching out to ASI because they tend to have a little bit more money. Um, maybe um, your sustainability director has a little lot of money that she wants to kick in or, you know, your uh, Christine's department over at student health and counseling, student health, whatever your department's called. Um, so I think there are ways to do it. It just might not have as broad of an impact. It might not reach the thousands or hundreds of people that, um, I don't think Sarah, we've reached thousands, but at least hundreds that we've, we've reached um, thus far. So get creative would be my solution and maybe um, start to bubble up from the ground level, which sounds like you all are already starting to do that, um, and then partner across as many entities as you can that are out there on your campus that maybe have a few hundred dollars in resources that they can put towards something like this. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, I would definitely echo what Julie said, be creative, but also looking for funding. There is there is money out there. Like we just submitted, um, I'm sure all campuses have similar programs. We have one called Campus Quality Fee, where you can apply for internal funding from the campus. 
for any program or um, service that benefits students. And so we're going to be applying for that as well because of COVID. It, we, it's on hold, but those that is like you know ten twenty thousand dollars that you can apply for um, each year for funding, um, and it is it does tie in with basic needs. So we haven't actually done this because we do have funding, but it's something that is on my list to do in the future. The chancellor's office sometimes provides funding for basic needs initiatives, student success. Um, so it ties in, you know, it definitely crosses a lot of different. Um, boundaries, I would say, of different areas that you can tap into and connect it with. And so, yeah, definitely be creative, reach out to other departments. The other thing I would say is if you reach out to CUP companies, a lot of them offered us a big discount when buying like a high volume. And some might even give you some for free. If you say, you know, can I, if you, maybe they give you 25 here, 25 there. Um, so I definitely wouldn't hesitate to reach out. There are so many companies out there now, and a lot of them are working directly with universities. Um, and so definitely, you know, if you reach out to them as a student and let them know, um, you know, what your mission is, I, I think there would be companies out there that would be supportive. Thank you. And another question was, um, how long have you been implementing the program on your campus for Juliana and Sarah? So we started in spring of 2019 was the initial launch of our events. Um, and then the funding came for fall of 2020. So we had started the Breaking Down the Stigma events prior to actually getting funding, um, which was a good impetus to showcase, hey, we're doing these events, um, now give us funding type of thing. <laughs> and actually I should say, so we do have this funding, it's called the Sustainability Projects Fund. It's funded through ASI student fees. It's not a lot of money. It's like $15,000 for the whole year. However, um, when, when Marina had put forth her funding application, she only submitted for a thousand. And the committee was like, this is like an amazing project. We actually I think we might have lost her. <laughs> Sarah, feel free to respond if you want, just in case Juliana got dropped from her internet. <laughs> we can bring up the next question now. Okay. Uh, so the next question is for Christine. So does uh, CSU East Bay Health Center offer student op uh, free options for more sustainable menstrual products or uh, contraceptives? Um, Um, so this is a new concept that the typical products here, the, the tampons and the pads, but we haven't gone forth and done the, uh, the cup yet, which is sounds like it'd be something I'd like to bring forward. Something new, challenging. We'd be happy to partner in the Office of Sustainability, Christine. So let us okay. know how to support. Okay. It may take us a little bit till we get back on campus because it's hard to do things remotely. I'm having a lot of trouble with my internet today too, but I think it's an awesome project to move forward on. So I would definitely like to touch bases with our other part of our teams. Um, one thing really quick I forgot to mention as well, I don't know if East Bay you have this, but we also have a wellness vending machine on campus, which initially started with like, um, you know, Tylenol, Advil, condoms, but we've actually added, so we have the reusable menstrual cups in there too, which, you know, this is kind of on hold because nobody's on campus, but it is still available. Um, and so the menstrual cups, we have them for $5 just because it's not free to do, you know, to get things from the vending machine, um, but it's still heavily subsidized, you know, so if the cup usually costs $30, you can get one for five bucks. And that way you don't have to like rely on when the food pantry hours are, or when the health center is open, when the sustainability center is open, it's open 24 
seven, you can go to this wellness vending machine. And we, um, you know, Christine had also mentioned plan B. We also have plan B available in our um, wellness vending machine for students too, um, as well as single use menstrual care products. So we do realize that, you know, not everyone's gonna jump on this bandwagon right away. There might still be some hesitation. Um, the first time, if you, you know, start your period on campus, you might not wanna try a menstrual cup for the first time. So you can still get those um, single use products in the vending machine too. Awesome. Another question was for um, Sarah. So are they still taking appointments now, even though uh, like if everything's online right now, like for walk-ins, if you want to get products? Yeah, we have the menstrual cups right now in our food pantry, which is open three days a week. And so, and that is available for walk-in. And so we just have um, like a QR code that folks can scan when they go in to take that quiz and then give us their email address and then um, get their menstrual cup. And then we can also, um, we haven't had anybody do this, but we could, if they reached out to us, we would be happy to mail them to folks that don't feel comfortable going to campus. So is there a limit on how many appointments you can make or? No, it's, it's open. Um, we do have, I think it just follows the general rules of the food pantry that you can go once per day. Um, but we're not, we haven't seen an issue with folks trying to, you know, take advantage of the program. So um, it's just, if you request one, you're able to get one. And we've, I have had students who've reached out to me like, oh, I got one, you know, from this department, from AS or wherever. And, you know, I want to try one for my friend. Can I get one for her too? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Go, of course. So um, yeah, we're happy to, you know, spread the love and have, you know, the more, more the merrier. So. And uh, another question for Christine. So um, someone wanted to know how we're able to make appointments for uh, getting like the products and are, there, are they still taking appointments even if we don't live on campus? So um, you are able to get make appointments. Um, unfortunately, unless it's an urgent need appointment, we don't come on campus unless it's uh, identified that we need to be there for a Thursday because we've because of the COVID, of course, has been affected for everything. But you can do what they call telemedicine, which is what we are doing. So we're trying to get that out. We're still here. We're still accessible um, for our students. The problem that we do have is the products because nobody's on campus. Um, we can't just, you know, leave them at the door, so to speak. Um, we need to figure out a means of like maybe an outside vending machine or something so I'd like to figure that out, that maybe something on our outside of our door that might work, an outside vending machine for the, at least the products. Um, but you can still make appointments and please encourage students to make those appointments. We're here. We miss our students. So one more question was about how the uh, partnership with Organica began in the first place. Can you say that again? Sorry, um, how did the partnership with Organica begin? So funny enough, Sarah and I were presenting at a different conference, the California Higher Ed Sustainability Conference. And um, right before that there, I think it was something that was pushed out, um, Sarah, I might be wrong, through ACI, which is the Association for the Advancement and Sustainability in Higher Ed, kind of the umbrella sustainability higher ed professionals. They, we have um, weekly bulletins that go out and open to you as a student as well. You are an ACI member. And so um, you all can sign up for those bulletins. However, it came out and it just was like a blurb, organic cup, partnering campus cup, something or another, <laughs> um, free menstrual cups. And I was like, wow, that's you know very serendipitous since we're giving this presentation. <laughs> um, and so I signed up right away. Um, I there were some, interesting things with them. And I think they uh, maybe had some distribution issues. Anyhow, ours came and um, it, you know, it was fairly seamless. The students signed up on their like Google Doc form and then the Google Doc form got sent, I was had access to it. So um, when we did our distributions, we had everyone's like their name and then the size because they offered three different sizes for students. And so um, we had their size and then we did a drive-through pickup on campus um, during COVID that got approved through all the different measures. And so we had a number of students come through that way. And then, like I said, I mailed a whole bunch. I will say mailing them actually was way more money than I assumed they were gonna be because the box makes the little package more money. And so I think it came out to like $4 basically for each one to be mailed. Um, 
So I was not expecting that. Thankfully, I had a little bit of funds that I could use to subsidize that. I was going to just cover the cost if it was like $50. But when it came back and it was like $300, I was like, whoa, that's a lot more than I thought. So just be cognizant of that if you're thinking about this and you want to reach students that are not on campus right now or live in the vicinity and can come pick up. So. Okay, I have another question for Christine. So do we need to have healthcare for the telemedicine appointments and are they 24 seven? Um, for, you mean, as long as you're a student at the health center, you can come, you can get a telemedicine uh, visit. Um, they're Monday through Friday. Um, so they're from nine o'clock to 4.30. Um, and that's Monday through Friday. So there, we're available there. We have a provider, a nurse practitioner who can answer your needs, your questions, whatever is the issue. And then depending upon what it is and the emergent need, if it, we need to come in, we can come in on Thursday and the student can be met with us there. We've kind of crunched the time frame because of COVID and we wanna make sure everybody brings their mask when they come into the health center and hopefully at some point in the near future we'll be able to go to the health center and see our students again all right i think we're almost at a time any last minute questions before we go i have another one okay. so, <laughs> this one's my question so a lot it, it's open for anyone but a lot of people realize the effects like of uh, single-use menstrual products like on the environment but I think like they're, they're scared of using the alternatives or they're um, they think it's not sanitary so if, if anyone could speak on that um, I can say that most of the cups are made out of medical grade silicone which is um, very clean and they're very easy to clean too you can rinse them so you can wear them so one thing that's great that's um, especially when you're on campus that I feel is actually more sanitary is you can wear them for up to eight hours, depending on how heavy your flow is. So that way you're not having to go in these public restrooms and, you know, take out your menstrual products and then go and wash your hands. So you can keep them in the entire time that you're either at work or in, in class. Um, and um, what I tend to do is try to find on campus, you learn where the single use stalls are. So rather than having to go in where, you know, where there's a lot of different restrooms, you find where it's just one single bathroom. So that way you have the whole place to yourself with the sink and the toilet. Um, and you can rinse it out if you need to. Um, but yeah, you can use any like unscented soap to clean them between like when you take it out or just rinse it with hot water. Um, and then after your cycle, you can boil it and then it's completely um, sanitized again and then store it, make sure it dries completely. And then it could, they, they all come with a little pouch that you can store them in. And so it's very clean. Um, and just, of course, make sure to wash your hands, which you would do, you know, between when you're changing it, which you would do with a single use product anyway. And like I said, they can last up to 10 years with proper care um, and boiling them. Um, so yeah, they're very, very clean. Yeah, and I would just add that you don't actually, so you should sanitize, um, boiling is one option. I actually, I have two young kids as well. And so I got as a gift or something, somebody gave me these like bags, they're like sanitized bags that you can stick in the microwave. So you, um, it was actually used for like pump parts for nursing <laughs> and like bottles and stuff like that. And I just have so many still that I just use those. And so that's not a single use option. You can use the bag for 20 times, but they also make um, these little sanitizing cup, um, uh, like, I don't know what they're called, but they're, you can look on Amazon or different companies, but they're like sanitizing cup things. <laughs> that doesn't help, but, um, and they're just a few dollars, like maybe five, 10, $15 on Amazon. Um, and you can use those if you don't want to boil. Um, the other thing I would just say is that, um, as Sarah said, there's so much more, in my opinion, sanitary, um, I feel like, than, than a tampon. Oh, yeah, those little cup things. There you go. <laughs> and you just stick them in the microwave, right? Um, and and then you, you can do it that way. So um, the other thing I would say is that um, they just are, I don't, I just feel cleaner. So when you talk about sanity, sanit, you know, maybe being you, you do have to be a little bit more intimate with your body. Let's just put it that way. But other than that, I think they're, they're better in my opinion. Um, the one other thing I would say is they're great for like camping and outdoor adventures and stuff like that. Because again, 
you don't have to, Sarah said eight hours. I actually leave mine in sometimes for 12 hours. And so you're only changing them like once, you know, twice within a 24 hour period. And so, um, you know, if you're lucky and therefore when you're out camping in the back country or even just camping, it's, it's much easier. So keeping that in mind. If anybody has any last minute questions, feel free to chime in now. Um, I just want to put a quick plug in that the next Sustainy Spain meeting will be next Thursday. Same, um, it, it'll be from 12.15 to 1.15. Um, so an email will go out to everyone if you want to attend. Please be sure to follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube to stay updated. Our handle for all those platforms is at Sustainy Spay. Um, so thank you all for coming. If we could have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you so much for sharing all the information that you did share. Um, it was really good to talk with everyone. Um, yeah, I hope to see you guys at the next meeting or sometime when we return to campus. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.